We're going to start off today. We have a source recording artist, um, Erlen Oy, um, half of Kings of Convenience, as well as a solo artist, and we're going to find out about him today. Tell us who you are, what do you do? I'm now 28 years old. When I was 16, I started playing guitar. I've been in several bands trying to figure out how to become a famous pop star. I always, when I was, when I was 16, I thought that by 17, surely I would be at my goal. When I was 17, I thought, well, you know, well, it didn't really work out, but that was because of him, and now a new band, when I'm 18, all over the world. And it took eventually eight years, and I always thought it was just around the corner. But anyway, um, when uh, at some point I started playing with my friend Eric as Kings of Convenience, we are an acoustic duo making very simple songs with very little, very little drums. Um, and we got signed to a label in the UK called Source. Uh, at the same time as we got signed, I also, uh, my uh, interest for electronic music was uh, born from living in Bergen, Norway, which is a place where a lot of, well, dance music had a strong position in the town in the late 90s. And I always thought that, uh, that they, could, they could get me to sing instead of the big black woman. Um, and there's a band called Rakesop, and one day I was standing outside their studio I was hearing some pumping rhythms to the door and I started to sing to myself. And so I knocked on the door and I asked if they um, wanted to hear the song that I've been making. And uh, <coughs> this is this, uh, well I can just play too. We, we recorded the album with Kings of Convenience. Uh, maybe I should play something about Kings of Convenience too. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, and how long had Kings of Convenience been a group or...? Kind of since 1997 yeah. we started doing things, but we, we didn't really work, um, we didn't really work um, all the time. It was... Um, it was just a collection of songs uh, or did you guys play out or... Um, I mean, how did you acquire a deal? Did you have a demo? The, the reason, how did we acquire a deal? Because I was living in London and I was living in Manchester because I thought I should be where music is happening and that would be where you would get to know people. And I really didn't know how to do it because it's the problem with King's Convenience, there was no particular scene to latch onto. If you, if you make house music, you can, there's a lot of house labels, a lot of people you can get to know. If you make acoustic music, I mean, it's... Uh, like it, when I was telling people I was in a band, with two acoustic guitars and two vocals. Uh, people were like, okay, okay. You play blues? No, we don't play blues. And um, oh, we can hear some of that, yeah? Okay, yes. Yeah. So it's 97 when you were working with this guy and um, you get the deal with Source, yeah? Mm -hmm. What year was that? That was in, in the end of 1999. We got in contact with them and we signed a deal in um, April 2000. Here's a song. At this time, I had also made one more song with Rakes Up, and I, I, I was, I was really enjoying the thing about singing on electronic music. I mean, generally, I really like to dance, but my main problem when I go out to dance is that so many of the songs, so many of the, the dance music is, it's not very <laughs> deep. <laughs> Especially when it comes to lyrics and, you know, I very often, very seldom, I don't get hit by the vocals in dance music. Was your introduction to electronic music with this project or uh, had you been listening to it before? Coming from music like this, I guess, with a really acoustic background and songwriting and saying that you really didn't find electronic music so deep as far as the writing aspect and songwriting, arranging and that kind of thing. What attracted you to electronic music? And I heard your, uh, your solo album, and it's very electronic. So what, yeah. 
What was the bridge well, from this to well, that? Basically, I guess it was particular. I went to a festival in Finland in, in the summer of 2001, and I saw a band called Mr. Velcro Fastener, who are really kind of hard electro sound. And seeing them was, uh, made me very excited, because their music was very hard, at the same time as they were um, um, very intelligent. I really liked the control of this music. It was really fast and it was really kind of hard, but they had a lot of control of what they were doing. What I didn't really like was the vocals, so I thought, I don't know, that was worth a, a shot to combine this music with my type of songwriting. And as I was doing this, I mean, I got into this idea that like Mr. Velcro Fastener, there must be tons of good electronic music, electronic music producers around the world that you have never heard about. And if I could find them, then, you know, it could be, it could make something special. But what eventually happened is that as, as, as when these people wanted, went to work with me, I think they all had the idea that now they were going to make something different from what they were doing. They were going to make something a little bit more like chill out music, which is not really what I wanted to do because I find with Kings of Convenience is my idea of listening music. If you're just sitting down and you're not going to dance, you might as well, you don't need more than two instruments. I mean, th this is a little bit general generalization, but. So um, it ended up somewhere in between. So here's the song that I made with Morgan. We met, you know, it's like, okay, hello. Okay, let's make a track together. And it's, a, of course, it can be a little bit of an awkward start, but I don't know, I quite like that. I quite like the awkward start. And then you basically start from nothing. I mean, you start with a drum beat, you start with a BPM. <laughs> And usually, you would start making something, and by day three, we basically, we had some idea of a chord and a melody structure, and by then, we totally redid what we have done. Like it was more of a, kind of a more of a housey sound, and, and I was saying, yeah, I don't know, I want kind of more like a, a synth bass line, which is kind of, which got some individual textures to it. And he said, oh, uh, you mean like this? And he's like, and then he just played the whole bass line of the whole song. I said, yeah, like that, great. <laughs> oh, why didn't you say so in the first place? I don't know, I didn't know. <laughs> so it was just kind of work in progress as you, as you went along, that was it? Yeah, I mean, and then we had, we had many different parts. And what usually happen is that when you come to the end, you kind of have to cut away at least half of the stuff you've made to make it into a song and not like a collection of ideas. Right. And also you have to, I had made, made many different vocal ideas and I had to sort of come down to something and I had to write the lyrics finished, which is, it's just really hard. So I was just, I was just sitting in cafes like, mm, 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 mm. and well, eventually you think of stuff, so. And what's your musical background? Like, what were you inspired by growing up? What music did you listen to? Well, I mean, when it comes to electronic music, I guess it all starts with aha. Okay. <laughs> Which is, uh, I don't know, they're, it's really, it is electronic, you know? It's just the fact that there is so much pop there that you don't really see that they actually have. And what about the aspirations <laughs> of becoming a pop star? You still have this? You're still waiting to be a pop star? I don't know. I think I'm, as long as I'm being paid to go down to talk about songwriting in Cape Town, that's as much pop star as I'd ever want to be. That's cool. On, on the new CD, did you basically just write vocal parts, or did you have any um, involvement in the other instruments or electronic instruments that were going on. And also, my, the second part of the question is, um, has, in contrast to the Kings of Convenience stuff, has um, working with more traditional dance producers made you think about songwriting in a different way? Well, 
Okay, first question first. Um, I mean, when it comes to, yeah, I mean, we, we most, of, most of the time we basically wrote it together in the same way I guess I would work with Eric in Kings of Convenience, you know? Like, I would play just some chords, he would play start with a bass line, I would change the chords, and I would say, well, what if you play that in the bass line? And he says, yeah, what, what, what if you play that in the chords? And, and it kind of goes from there. I mean, um, a common misconception about how the record was made is that people think that I was writing on acoustic guitar and coming to them and made them to make a remix. I find this to be, uh, I mean, this is done a lot, and I find that I, I would probably get a different, to a different place if I do it actually as, in, as collaboration. It's not really like remixes. Um, but it was different from producer to producer. Some people had very strong ideas, you know, they had really made up their mind when I got, when I, when I got there and I really thought of something that they thought would work. And uh, so, you know, and if they really had like an idea, like, like um, Schneider TM from Berlin, he had, he had you know, he, he was like, no, 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 you stay out, you do the vocals. And it was like, okay. But I mean, most people, I mean, like we, they weren't really sure about how we were going to do it. So I thought the best, the most fun part I find is to, to work through it together. It just feels, often feels more better if you, if you know that you kind of, you were just doing it. It would, like it would never have happened if it wasn't for the fact of you two together in a room. I particularly like when someone has already made a beat. Um, made a beat and maybe a simple bass line and some chords and then I can come up with something, Cause, or, or you don't. I mean, sometimes you just hear a beat and some chords, and it's like, and it's, it's there already, and it's really quick. And that's quite, quite cool, because then the process, it's already come to a certain point, and then you, I think, then I can really feel I can, can contribute to, to see how the song should be finished. Because if you start a song from scratch, when you've gotten halfway, you've already started to be a little bit deaf about what the, the, um, the possibilities of that track is. And if you, kind of, if you come a little bit later in the process, that means that you m can really quickly see you know, how long should this go before it goes into this and, you know, yeah. I don't know whether Roy Kassop was signed at, uh, when you had first heard that song, but you know, would know that they started out with that label, Telly, which is from Norway, yeah. and that had a lot of subsidiaries of like strict dance music and pop music and sort of weirder, weirder things. Um, did you know about them at, at all before you? Yes, uh, actually, uh, I should probably mention that uh, earlier on. Like, the way I knew about Reksop was my friend Mikal Tele, who runs Tele Records. He put out um, some seven inches of Kings of Convenience very early on. And he also put out the first seven inch by Reksop. So I'd heard of them through him. And um, I guess on, from that 7-inch, I wasn't like super impressed. But he also had like, um, at some point I was visiting him, he had a CD with some demos of theirs. It's actually quite amazing because like, you know, a song like Epple, the one that goes I was like, hey, check this out. Like, isn't this great? Yeah, well, this is great. And this is like in 1999 or something like this. And it's, it's really exciting to think about it now, after we've sold a million copies, that, that uh, yeah, I, I, I thought it was great when I heard it too. <laughs> well, uh, but anyway, so this was how, uh, this was how I got my, their attention to them. Particularly, they also had this track with Anneli Drecker, track three on the record, there's a, uh, a track with a, a woman singing. And I really liked the way, I mean, that's kind of really appealed to me as a real song together with good production. And I found that to be very special. So this is kind of how I got the idea of, 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 of working with them. And that's probably why I decided to stop outside their door and, and listen to the, to the beats. For your solo album, you pretty, were you pretty freeform or did you have any idea of the sound that you were going for in electronic music? Because I hear, as I mentioned to you before, a bit of Pet Shop Boys in the vocals. And it's very 80s, but it's very now as well. Did you have this in your mind or? Well, I mean, the thing, actually, I think th a downfall of the CD is that I had a little bit too much of an idea. And I think, in, in retrospect, I wish I had let a little bit more of the producers own 
um, ideas and just come out a little bit more because at the moment it's a lot of it's a lot of tracks in in 120 bpm and there's a lot of stuff that I'm trying to do sort of an electro groove with uh, a synth bass line you know there's a lot of stuff where I'm doing this and it's kind of working but at the same time like the track with Schneider TM when he really he really had an idea and he really um, had a vision too and I was kind of more just being the vocalist is something that I, in retrospect I'm a little bit more proud of because it is going a little bit further and it was something I mean when we made it I was like yeah it's nice but I mean the track grew on me which is kind of funny <laughs> but I mean for sure the one thing I mean about my vocals in general is that I have a very limited voice I, like six years ago I mean people in Bergen were suggesting, so why don't you get another singer to that band of yours? They were politely suggesting that and you know. But, and the, the thing is that what's very important with voices is that you have to record yourself over and over again and try to sing in many different ways and suddenly you find, wait, when I'm doing this, it actually works. When I'm doing this, it doesn't work. And it's like, um, yeah, and that's different from every person. I'd just like to hear what you thought was the maybe the furthest stretch from yeah. what you expected from your own ideas of the album. I mean, even the text here, you know, is not something that I was a little bit unsure about it, but Schneider says it's great. Are you incorporating the electronic experience into the future Kings of Convenience projects? Like, are you bridging those things? Not really. I find that, I think that the... Uh, you want to keep them separate. I, no, I just I want to keep them separate. I just find that Kings of Convenience are special because it is just, it's so simple as it is. Yeah. And the moment you have a little bleeps and blops, it was just, it maybe might try to be a little bit more with the times, yeah. but it stops being timeless yeah, and it sure. starts getting dated very soon. Yeah, but there's a way I believe that you can do both. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A know. Amen. You're also doing the, the next DJ Kicks projects as well. Yes, I am. And I'm, I'm, whenever I DJ, I, um, I can't stop singing, you know. <laughs> it's just so yeah, you were saying that you actually uh, you sing over the instrumental things that you play while you're DJing. Yes, Very I do. Very interesting concept. Can you show us this? I'll see if I can do something like that. I mean, the main, the main, main fun about it is that if you are playing, you play stuff that you, maybe you don't know so well, and you play it, and then you just think about things as you are playing to people, because your brain works a little bit different, and you, maybe you understand a little bit better what is it that will work here in this venue when you're actually in the venue, instead of you're in a, you know, in a studio which is very far away from the reality which the track is going to be played in. And do you just make it up as you go, freestyle, or do you have ideas in your mind of what you would Yeah, sing? I mean, where often I sing, I mean, I sing, I sing, um, often cover songs, because, I mean, if you have the lyrics already, I mean, of yeah. course, it's a little bit easier. With the label Source, I mean, I don't know much about the label outside of uh, their success with some of the hip-hop that they've released seems very different um, sort of label. I know they're um, associated with Virgin, yeah? Virgin UK. Yeah, and during, we were signed to Source when it was still an independent. And then eventually the, the boss of our company got asked if he could be the MD, which is the managing director of Virgin UK. Yeah. So he said yes, and um, uh, he said that it would not change his um, the way he did Source Records, but eventually it did. And this was when my solo album was released, and unfortunately I felt that it's, it, was an, it was an album that would work really well when Source was an independent, yeah. but now, as it was a really virgin, it kind of, I mean, it wasn't pop enough to be a pop album. At the same time as, uh, it's not really underground enough to be, you know, an underground release. It's, it's not like, it's not really 12 inch music either. So it kind of fell a little bit in between two chairs. Do you find it frustrating being in a situation that you sign a deal with an independent that 
basically became a major? What, what are yes. the, difference in, the differences um, creatively or maybe the things that you have to go through now since it's a corporate situation, solo project, group project? Yeah, I mean, it's um, like a major record company wants you to do a lot of stuff. And they'll also very often ask you to change, to try to format your music to work with whatever their reality is. In England, it's always Radio 1. If they can get it on Radio 1, it will sell a lot of records. If they can't, it won't. And it, become, it becomes very boring to listen to them because everything they ask you about is basically centered around this one thing to get on this one radio station. And it also, I think that in the long run, it just doesn't help you if you try to conform to this. Because yeah. so many people try. You try to make stupid remixes, and then eventually they won't play it either. I mean, of course, I mean, no one's going to play something which really isn't a project. If you have a project with a soul, it's either they like it as it is, or they don't. Yeah. And if you try to give them something which is totally changed from what it originally is, then you can't defend it anymore. And of course, you'll be a you know, one-hit wonder. I mean, or you can't. I mean, at least with the way, the le at least the level I'm doing, I am kind of a, a real artist making real music. So, I mean, Kylie Minogue for sure can do whatever. I mean, she can do it whatever way she wants to, because that's not really the point of her. I mean, she's, she's got a great body. I don't she's have a great an image body. image more than the actual. Wait.